Um, so four years ago, I did a, a presentation at this very nonprofit update, right? Four years ago, pre-pandemic, we were all in a room. We were eating tasty breakfast that the Serini team provided for us. Um, and what I wanted to do, my partner, Frank Orzo, suggested this, who many of you know, is kind of start off as if we were in the room together. But of course, we're all wherever we are alone in our home offices or, or homes, um, or, or now we're on site, many of us. Um, but I wanted to start off with the same power pose that got us going. So if you're feeling like you've been sitting in Zoom land for too long, can everyone, I can't see you all, but I'm gonna hope that um, if you can hear me and you're engaged, which I hope you are, can you do your, can you do your arms up? Do a good 30 seconds. You don't need to stand up because, well, I can't see you, but you know, with Zoom land, we're not all properly attired when we work from home. I'm not gonna say any more about that. <laughs> I am today. The power pose can help get you out of your funk, re-engage, and give you more confidence for the rest of your day. All right. Hopefully that helped. That was really fun in person four years ago, and hopefully next year we'll be on site all together. So let me jump into this deck. There we go. All right. So we're gathered here today to talk about strategic planning and why it needs to happen. Um, always, but now more than ever with the changing, um, constantly changing environment, um, new challenges cropping up constantly for all of our organizations, um, but especially across the nonprofit sector, right? More than, more than um, other spaces as always. So I'm Christine Deska. I'm the president and co-founder of Nonprofit Sector Strategies. We're going into our sixth year um, of business. And what we do is work with small and medium-sized nonprofit organizations. Um, we do a lot of strategic planning where we work with leadership teams and go through the entire process. And that's what we'll be talking about today, what that process can look like, should look like, some best practices that you may be um, engaging in already and some you may not be. So if there was one thing that I would like you to take away from this deck, it is smart strategic planning is vital for your organization's sustainability and success. It's not just something that is a nice thing to do. It is something that brings your team together. It is something that allows for your organization to have a greater uh, mission impact. So um, I can't state how important this is enough. The foundation the planning process really, really takes strong leadership. This is important. The commitment to making it a collaborative process is important, um, as well as building trust, right? So um, when you build trust among your teammates, it makes the process that much more comprehensive, more rich. Um, and then transparency, right? Communicating about the process to everyone um, in your organization and your stakeholders. So, um, to that end, I'm gonna go through what I think and what we've seen over the years and what I experienced myself in working in nonprofits um, for my entire career before starting NSS six years ago um, are really, really the important main eight components for your strategic planning process. But before we jump in, I wanted to ask Kelly to launch our two quick poll questions so I can get a sense of who's in the room and where you might be with your planning process. So take a moment and answer these two questions. How would you describe your role at your nonprofit? And how would you describe your organization's strategic plan? Hopefully these uh, options make you laugh a little bit. Active, effective strategic plan in place. If that's you, kudos and please share some of what's working in the chat as we go along. Um, somewhat effective plan. We, we take a look at it here and there. Um, the third one is an existing plan, but it's just sitting around. No one's really using it. That's kind of the worst because you've gone through a process and then you're not um, utilizing your plan to grow your organization. The fourth one, wait, what is a strategic plan? Maybe for newer organizations or those of you who've been operating, um, you know, in emergency mode, you don't have one right now. It's okay. It's never too late to, to kick off the planning process. And then if you're in the midst of your first planning process, or maybe you're a board member uh, on, on, the, um, on our meeting today and you don't know, that's fine too. So let's see what we have turned up here. Okay, more than half of you are in leadership roles, wonderful. 
14% management, 5% support staff, four board members, welcome. Um, four profits, only one, and then one other, the mystery person, okay? <laughs> and then we have, okay, about a quarter. Oh, great, okay. So five um, participants have an active plan. Another nine somewhat, okay, existing. Wait, okay, so five folks that haven't yet started. Okay, well, I hope this is especially helpful for you all. Oh, good, and one organization just started. Okay, great, this is really helpful. Um, so let me close this out and jump in. So first component. Okay, so do you have the right people in the room? And for those of you who've already gone through this process, it's always good to revisit who is part of your strategic planning process. Um, Typically, as a best practice, you want your, your leadership team um, involved, right? The, the folks who are in the day-to-day, -day, responsible for the organization's, um, all the organization's work. Um, but another way to make sure you have the right people in the room is to ask your board members or select key board members to be involved. Um, the best planning processes that we've worked on um, at NSS have involved a subsection of board members. It really helps with buy-in um, and it makes for a more effective planning process because you're getting more, um, more perspectives, more expertise in the room. Thirdly, the feedback from those that you serve. A really, really um, uh, effective planning process involves surveying, pulling from past surveys or even holding a listening session um, with the folks that you serve. Um, fourthly, management input, right? There, there are things that you as leadership team members may not know that is happening within the programs. And that's going to be part of the planning process, right? Where are the key growth areas within your programming? And so if you're not kind of going to the key management people on the front lines to get that information, you might be missing out and going in a direction that's not, um, not the most strategic for your organization. And lastly, a strong facilitator. And I'd like to think that that's what I am, but many of your organizations have those in-house. Um, when I worked at AARP, I developed facilitation skills that have served me very well. And many of you are probably in the same position at your organization. You're running a lot of different meetings. You're, you're corralling of volunteers. You are managing multiple programs. Um, whether it's a series of strong facilitators or one to shepherd this process along, um, it's really important. So I always say this, my cousin with four children says a shared responsibility is no responsibility. <laughs> you don't want a child to go missing. So this process needs to rest um, with someone's uh, on someone's shoulders, right? And that person can delegate um, as, as needed, but without that, the process can go awry. It can get off track. Um, I'll talk later about the importance of having a roadmap um, documented for your process. This is something that we do with every project. It aligns the team together. You know where you're moving. You know what's what's expected of the planning process. And then you can be um, in step together and feel rewarded as you go through the process and make, and, and make progress. So second component. Um, I'm sure many of you who have an active plan in place have started with something called a SWOT analysis. So this is really important to center your organization, um, to really revisit your organization's key strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And so this is really taking a look at what internal factors, those are your strengths and weaknesses. This could be physical resources, financial, your human capital, you know, that's typically a key strength, your employees, your volunteers. Um, what access do you have to other um, trademarks, copyrights, um, your operations? Um, all of this is important to kind of gather all in one place under your strengths. Um, and in terms of your external factors, your opportunities and threats fall into this category. These are some things that are out of your control, right? We heard Ken speak this morning about the state of the economy right now. Um, none of us can really control that, right? But we have to operate within that environment. You know, similarly, what are the market trends that are going to affect your organization going forward? Um, are there a shift in the, is there a shift in the needs of your particular audience that you're serving? Um, funding, right? This is always in flux and Ken made the great point about government funding kind of 
um, declining right now. There was a lot thrown out during the pandemic, and now it's there's there's dollars being pulled back, right? So how do we adjust and and, and make note of those um, threats that are coming our way? The political climate is always an issue. Politics is, is unfortunately or fortunately involved in all that we do. Um, so kind of centering ourselves around these four quadrants really will serve us well to then move to identify um, our goals. So overall, you know, we want to come out of this brainstorming session ready to foster our organization's strengths, we're going to eliminate as many weaknesses as possible, capitalize on opportunities, and minimize threats as much as we can. So a key part of your planning process should also be revisiting, reviewing your mission, vision, and values. Um, this is important. You know, Judy Siegel from Pro Bono Partnership makes the point, not only is there a legal responsibility here to stay within the bounds of what you have filed for your organization, um, but also not falling victim to mission creep, but also if there's an opportunity that is so significant and you need to adjust your mission, to really identifying that. And if you haven't done a planning process in three to five years, the entire landscape could have changed. And especially with the pandemic that we're in or out or, or wherever we are with it these days, the landscape is very different now than it was just a few years ago. Um, so taking the time to gather as a planning committee and really take a look at the vision that you have on paper, the mission that you have on paper and that you filed, right? Um, and then the team building aspect of this is, is looking at the core values of your organization and reflecting on, are you acting in accordance with those values and really allowing your team to share um, their, their feelings on that if you want to add values. Um, and this is where, you know, I'll mention um, at the end that something like diversity, equity, and inclusion is kind of a standard or should be a standard part of these planning processes because there are educational components of those efforts that should really be interwoven through these processes. And many organizations know this and are addressing this now. Um, and if you're starting a new planning process, it's important to think about how you're addressing equity and inclusion um, in your work also. So just to recap, Hopefully you're, you're, when you're in your planning process, you're seeing that your mission is reflective of your purpose, that your vision is reflective of what your organization hopes to achieve or become in the future, and that your values are really your core principles and represent your ethics. Okay, so next up, key growth areas. This can be such a fun part of your planning process because you're coming together as a planning committee to really together collaboratively identify where does your organization have the most potential for growth. Um, it could be stating the obvious, but oftentimes programs um, that could be interconnected aren't so integrated. Um, it could be that there's an opportunity in the market um, or a partner organization that has come to you or um, so many things that could be coming together that you're not quite identifying as a growth area as you're moving at such a fast pace, wearing so many hats. So these, this session, um, which will result in other planning brainstorming sessions, allows for the alignment of your group. Um, and of course you lean on your SWOT, right? Where you've identified opportunities in your SWOT analysis should really feed into what your key growth areas are. Um, now we found the most success here in coming up with um, matrices that really also consider your capacity and your resources, right? Just because there's an opportunity doesn't always mean you can execute on that. Um, and we'll talk more about the goals and timeline um, as it relates to, to that piece. Um, but you, you have to be realistic about your capacity. How can you grow your capacity if that's needed to achieve um, or deliver on a particular growth area? And then of course, the resources that you have access to and where those are, are going over time. So the challenge here can really be prioritization. There can be so many competing growth areas um, but when you kind of structure your conversations as a planning committee, you can really 
identify the key areas and be, um, you know, be in alignment there, which personally is what's most important. Um, but this really helps to come together as a group and identify these areas and get them on paper as part of your plan. So from there, you can hopefully get to what are your main strategic goals. Um, we typically, as a best practice, look to set these in a one, two, and three year, um, at one, two, and three year markers. This is key. You know, there was a, a trend a couple years ago where people kind of were saying, oh, you shouldn't plan more than a year out. Our world is changing so rapidly. Um, but I think, um, and please, you know, in the chat, let me know how this has worked for you. But a year goes by in the blink of an eye. Yes, the landscape is changing, but if you're not planning farther ahead than that, you're going to get behind. You're going to miss the boat on something. You're, you're not going to be forward thinking enough or as Ken mentioned, proactive enough um, to really serve your organization well and, and position yourself to have the most mission impact. So within these main strategic goals, there's some core areas that hopefully you're, you're addressing in your plans if you have one already or will be, um, if not. And those are resource development, right? Which spans all of the areas of growth. Board development is important to include, right? Because your board being sustainable, being um, effective has a big impact on your organization and where it's headed. Social enterprise is something that we talk about a lot with the clients we work with. You know, where are there opportunities to not only grow your mission, but bring in additional revenue? Um, and lastly, your programming, of course. Um, so what I will say is, while the one, two, and three-year goals are most important to get down on paper, we really find the most value in also setting aside one more session to also discuss visioning. Um, and this can be a really fun um, way to think um, in the future where your organization will be. For example, ask right now for those of you listening um, and not multitasking, um, where do you see your organization in 10 years? Now there's inevitably one person in our sessions who will say, well, I don't know, but I'll be on the beach. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But really, you know, there are, are factors, um, there are movements like artificial intelligence. Is that going to affect how you serve your audience? There are different market trends. Um, your audience's needs could be shifting and how will technology impact that in 10 years? Um, so if you're not thinking ahead, your organization could end up being obsolete in 10 years. Um, so many things can happen to affect you know, where your organization is going to be, what the needs will be of your, of your service audience. So I would say if you can prioritize and calendar that session, it will really serve you well because oftentimes there's an aha moment of, wow, we could be working towards this, but probably won't happen for five to 10 years. But having that vision really brings your leadership team together, brings your committee together to, to set this vision um, all in one place. And you can just document that as part of your strategic plan in terms of visioning. Here's where we are. And you'll have that to kind of go back to as you're working towards your, your one, two, and three-year goals. All right, next up, budget. Um, so in terms of budgeting, it can be challenging to even get one year um, um, defined these days. Um, Ken made the point to, um, you know, look at being adaptive with your budget, contingency planning. If you're gonna, you could have a 10% cut because of the different fluctuating regulations or, or different factors that affect your organization. But it is important to really try to include the one-year budget in your strategic plan and then year on year adding to that to ensure that it's always current. Um, you know, this should go through your board or, or an audit or finance committee approval just like the entirety of your plan um, once completed. And then I always say what I, one of the things I learned in business school was projections are lies. <laughs> um, hopefully not, but it seems like, you know, you can't really rely on the different things you project that are coming your way. So the more you can use real numbers, um, and hopefully um, we have some CFOs on, on the um, meeting today 
who know this and who work very hard to ensure that the budget, um, the budgets that they put down on paper are as close to what's expected to be available funding wise to really keep your plan on track in terms of the resources that are needed for each of your key initiatives. Okay, metrics. So how do we even know, you know, if we're succeeding when it comes to a particular goal that we've set. That's when it really becomes important to identify metrics in accordance with your goals, with your key growth areas. So in the past, actually four years ago, when I presented at this very event, my entire 45 minutes, I'm looking at the clock to make sure I'm, I'm not going to go over, but I think we're good. My entire presentation was on social return on investment. And so, this is a challenging area in and of itself for nonprofits because it takes resources to prepare to convey your impact. Um, it takes research, it takes time, capacity. I will still continue to preach the importance of not only quantifying you know, the numbers of how many are attending your programming, how many people you're reaching, those are important numbers to track to be able to show engagement, show that you're resonating. Um, but to take that a step farther is really where you want to end up and to be able to say, you know, um, Amy's on from the book fairies, right? Because of the number of books we've been able to give to a particular school district, the literacy rates have gone from here to here. Um, or when I worked in anti-hunger efforts, it was, you know, the dollars the hard dollars that we know are reaching folks who are now eligible and receiving SNAP benefits, there's a there's a, um, a defined calculation to show the local economic impact there, right? So those are, are things you can kind of look for to better convey your impact. Ken mentioned this morning, and I'm sure Darren did, I only got to hear part of Darren's talk, um, you know, the importance of conveying this to your donors as well. You know, so this really, it's not just a good thing to do for your planning process. It's not just, you know, a best practice that makes it so you can really track your progress. It's, it will serve you well across the board to be able to um, identify the right metrics. So I, I um, really encourage you that if you have a plan, um, a strategic plan that's in motion to take a look and say, okay, if we set this large scale goal, um, did we assign metrics to that? Did, are we able to quantify this? And sometimes you're not, right? It could be, your goal could be um, create um, an onboarding process for our new board members by the time the next fiscal year ends. Okay, that's your metric, right? Um, but wherever you can quantify the impact and take it a couple steps farther, um, it could really, really go a long way. All right, and lastly, kind of piggybacking off of the metrics conversation, um, ongoing monitoring. Um, it's not a big lift to ensure that after you've defined your goals, after you've identified your metrics, that you come up with a way to track your progress and commit to the frequency in which you um, will track your progress. So we always come up with something called a strategic plan report card, um, we'll put it in place and suggest that at your quarterly board meetings, there's information communicated about your progress um, of your plan metrics. Um, it could be um, biannually as well, but this should be high level reporting that allows you as a strategic planning committee to reflect on where you are with your plan. Um, and I, I should probably have emphasized this throughout the presentation, but obviously this is always going to be an adaptive planning process because the factors that are outside your control um, are going to affect your organization along the way. So we often look at goals that have been set and say, okay, how can we note in our report card why this was not achieved because of a, of a given external factor or something that, that we predicted incorrectly, right? It, it, you don't shy away from adapting your plan or adjusting as you go. Um, it can feel you know, disheartening to have to report that something was not accomplished, but better to be honest and explain that and be upfront as you're doing a report out to your board or 
um, highlighting your key successes because it, it will it will the pendulum will swing both ways, right? On one hand, you might have to say something was not achieved, but on the other hand, successes could come you know fourfold where you least expect it. Um, you could have set goals that you've exceeded um, in other areas. Um, so I just can't emphasize enough that you're not only you know looking back to a report card to track your progress but also communicating your progress. All right, so we've gone through the eight components. We're making good time, so I'll check, get into the chat in a moment. Um, but this slide, I really wanted to um, kind of encapsulate the importance of how strategic planning and your organization's culture and diversity, equity, and inclusion should come together. You know, we as human beings, we want to feel included. It's a feeling, actually, we had this conversation in um, a DEI committee meeting we facilitated recently um, where we kind of identified that it's, uh, actually one of the board members identified that it's more of a feeling of belonging. And so we all kind of remember how something made us feel. And hopefully your organization is creating that feeling of belonging for the people who come in as staff, the people who come in to volunteer, um, the people you're serving, your, you know, your leadership team, your board members. And so it extends beyond the traditional, you know, um, you know, racial injustices that we're all trying to stay up to speed on in, in the news. Um, and so what I'll suggest is if you haven't as an organization taken the time to get centered around um, unconscious bias, or systemic and, systemic and structural racism. These are areas that you can have a consultant come in or you can find existing resources to, to bring your folks together to be, become more educated, to listen and learn and hear are people at your organization having this feeling of belonging or are there tweaks that you could be doing that could make all the difference. It could be something as simple as an engagement exercise where everybody is, um, outside sharing a, a pizza pizza lunch once a month to bring people together. You know, when it comes to feeling included and feeling belonging, it's often just feeling more connected with your fellow colleagues or with the people you serve with the mission. And so um, I'm happy to um, share suggestions on how we've seen those kind of little changes go a long way um, because we we heard um, throughout this morning's presentations, this issue of turnover or retention, right? And your organization's culture, I mean, it, it takes time to establish what that is and those feelings, but that can make all the difference with now employees or prospective employees having a lot of choices and constantly bopping around from one organization to another. And you don't wanna be saddled with the cost of constantly having to recruit and onboard um, if possible. So as a tangible um, best practice and suggestion, we're going to share in a follow-up um, a template to help get you started, or if you're, if you're in the midst of your process or want to use this for your next one or want us to help, what we do is we create a roadmap that really outlines the process, um, draft agendas, topic areas. This is stuff that's identified over time. Right? So you're not going to know at the onset of your planning process what those key growth areas are. You're not going to know maybe what key initiatives you need to discuss as a planning committee. But as time goes on, you'll have placeholders in your planning process, in your roadmap, that you can plug in. And it's just key to calendar and prioritize this so that your team isn't scattered. Right? Calendar this out so that it's, it's all you know, um, it, it, everyone knows what to expect, right? It's like anything else. You bring on a new board member. You want to manage their expectations, right? Your team is stretched already. So you have to come up with a, a planning process timeline that works for your organization. You know, we have groups that meet bi-weekly. We have groups that meet monthly, um, every four to six weeks. It really depends on what else is on, what else are you balancing? You know, is this a critical time of year for your main gala that everyone is all hands on deck for? Um, 
So, you know, make the process work for your organization um, and just get it down on paper because then you'll all feel connected to the process and be going through it together. You know, we'll, we'll literally um, gray out meetings and brainstorming sessions as they occur and you can see the progress. You can see that you're headed for this destination for launch. And I'm putting launch in quotes right now, if I'm on video still, because we know the work doesn't stop. The work is going on throughout a planning process, but at least you can feel that you're setting yourself up and your organization up for the next three years of really, really strategic goal setting. So I'm going to end with um, one of the slides I started with. You know, smart strategic planning is vital for sustainability and success. Um, doing, uh, embarking on this process in the right way, um, it can completely change the trajectory of your organization um, if it wasn't happening properly before. It can really set you up for longer term growth, longer term success, better partnerships, more revenue in your social enterprises, really all of the things that you're, you would want your organization to, to, to be that defines success for your organization, whatever that might be. So thank you all so much. We've got 39 folks on. This is fantastic. I'm going to open up the chat here and try to catch up. <laughs> Let's see. And feel free to add more in as I go through. Oh, I froze, but hopefully I'm okay now. <laughs> Your opinion on adding a member or two from frontline staff? Okay, Glenn, that's a great question. Um, you know, like I always say, you know your people, right? Some leadership members cringe when thinking of adding board members to a planning group, but others know the value of board members' expertise to really adding, really, if someone has a, a wonderful business background that could weigh in on a social enterprise, for example. So. I learned my, my nonprofit experience and, and my experience at NSS would lead me to say, be inclusive. The more folks you can include while keeping the process you know, organized, I think the better because you're going to get more input. Um, and a frontline staff person is going to have input and it doesn't need me, mean that that person needs to be at every single planning meeting, but having them at a key meeting or sometimes we do a breakout um, working group meeting, if we really need to dig in on a program and figure out what growth is possible, then that could be the session where you ask um, a frontline staffer to, to join in. Okay, Tom, the differences in vision, mission, values. Well, values is probably the easiest to start with because it's really your core principles. Um, let me see if I can go back to that slide without making everybody, okay. So, um, Tom, if you can see this slide, hopefully you can see, right, core values are, look, they have integrity, reliability, teamwork. These are principles that you want your, your team to take a look at and, and get aligned behind, right? Your mission, you can go back to your 990 to see what's on your, um, on your form, but also it's usually a little bit more evolved on your website, but should definitely be, um, reflective of what is on that form. Otherwise, you have a situation where you might need to um, adjust it through your friends at Pro Bono Partnership or your other um, um, lawyer buddies who are assisting your nonprofit. Um, but the vision is broader. The vision is really, you know, the future. Where do you see your organization in the future, right? This one is from a company that I grabbed. So it's saying um, to be the benchmark for program project management and engineering services. If depending on your industry and the people that you're serving, yours could be to be the go-to resource for, right? But really thinking into the future and where you wanna be. But your mission is your purpose, right? And you can also frame that in a, in a, um, in a session, you know, what would happen if your organization did not exist, right? And then you can kind of identify the gaps that would bubble up if your organization was not following through on its mission. So I hope that helps Tom, but feel free to um, follow up. Um, Dan, hopefully joined up with another organization to form a stronger. Yeah, we talk a lot about um, identifying partners 
And we're working with a client now where we're coming up with a really neat collateral piece called a menu of assets that we're going to use when we meet with potential partners, which could uh, end up being um, an acquisition opportunity, a merger. So um, I would say always be on the lookout to collaborate because you have to start somewhere, right? People talk a lot about merging, but um, that takes time, it takes due diligence. And so wherever you can start to form people to people relationships, because ultimately organizations are made up of people, um, that's where you wanna start. Are you syncing up with the organization's culture? right? We talked about before, um, because if not, it's, it's going to be harder to work together. Um, but we do, we do sessions just on partnership building and all the different ways you can partner in terms of administrative support versus programmatic versus, you know, housing your program within another organization in some way. So there's a lot of different ways to approach working with um, other groups. Let's see. Oh, Judy. Okay. Oh, there you go. How do you do preliminary due diligence? It's a lot of research, Judy, as I'm sure you're used to doing in your field. Um, it's really looking at, you know, what is the history of the organization? Are there any red flags? It's really looking deeply into the financials. I mean, there are consultants that specifically work on mergers and acquisitions, um, and it's, it's very nuanced when it comes to the nonprofit space. So it is a pretty in-depth process, and that's why I say that it's the, you know, dance before you marry um, approach, um, really get to know the organization from a practical standpoint before you begin your due diligence process. But I can also share information about some of the main due diligence components that we advise on. Um, but there's a lot to consider there because that is a really large commitment if you're really thinking of merging. When it comes to creating resource groups, um, at your organization, that can be a huge and, and fairly, no, I don't want to say a lighter lift when it comes to engagement. Um, so that tends to be where many organizations start in, in, in creating groups that can come together that may have similar cultural backgrounds or values um, in different ways. So we've seen that working pretty well. Um, it, it tends to need to rely on a stronger HR department um, at the same time. So I know smaller organizations are kind of struggling capacity wise in terms of the support there, but I'm happy to talk with you more about that as well, Tom. It's a good question. Okay, well, I was rushing because I didn't know how many more questions there were. We've got, let's see, it looks like four more minutes until the next session. So I'll talk about the next session and once I see a question come in, um, I hope you all can take a, even if you take a quick break, but next up um, at the nonprofit update event is a really fantastic panel of nonprofit executive directors. So I'm sure you'll hear more about planning. I'm sure you'll hear more real world examples of the challenges that come up, um, the challenges organizations are facing and how the organizations on this panel are overcoming those or asking their fellow organizations um, for support. I think the nonprofit space is so wonderful because we tend to come together and support one another as opposed to focusing on what could be considered competition. Um, so that's something that I know my partner and I really find refreshing in the work that we do, um, especially with strategic planning, because you can really see a team coming together. Um, I, I mentioned that earlier, and I'll, I'll just emphasize that again since I have one more minute. Um, you know, if if you're at a smaller organization, you might not have the resources to bring, bring someone in to do team building or have a retreat, right? Are you having board retreats? Um, are you having employee or staff retreats? You might not um, have had a chance to do that yet. You can kind of combine and embed that in with your strategic planning process. It's, it's more work than a retreat, obviously. It's more work focused, but it really has the same um, effect in terms of um, connecting your colleagues across the different silos. If you're an organization that's struggling with different entities or silos, or you're, you know, one program isn't speaking to another, just getting your folks in the same room together, bringing in that frontline staffer like Glenn suggested, it can make all the difference because you're bringing you're, you're bringing people together to form a connection. And I've seen this happen really, really nicely when an organization commits to having a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. 
because folks are coming in from different places of the organization, different vantage points. Um, with that and with any brainstorming session, what I will say is ground rules are incredibly important as well. And building that safe space, building that, that sense of trust is key. So let me leave you with that because without your group coming together and feeling comfortable, feeling engaged, it's going to make your planning process more strained. It's going to, you're gonna feel that sense of unrest in the room. And what you wanna feel is a sense of um, energy and excitement and you know, rewarding, um, a rewarding feeling of coming together and making progress.